Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about competency to stand trial, also called as fitness to stand trial. I am Dr. Suresh Badadmat, Professor of Psychiatry, working at Nimans, Bangalore. Before I start my presentation, I would like to place this disclaimer. This presentation is for academic and training purpose only. This is not an alternate for professional legal opinion. For legal opinion, please do contact an advocate. Conflict of interest? None. Along with this, I also would like to place a one more disclaimer. I'll be using certain terms such as unsoundness of mind, insanity, asylum, mental hospitals, such words which are derogatory and stigmatizing. I apologize for using such terms because I have been compelled to use such terms because these terms continues to exist in our judicial pronouncement, textbooks and also various literature. So, I do not have any intention to harm the sentiments of any persons with mental illness and their family members, mental ill professional and others. So, I apologize before in hand. With this, let's discuss about fitness to stand trial. The objectives of this video is to understand the competency to stand trial, how the referral is made, what are the assessment should be undertaken by the psychiatrist, reporting and how the decision is arrived regarding fitness to stand trial. The target audience for this video is doctors, psychiatrists, junior residents working in the field of psychiatry and forensic medicine, advocates, judges, nurses working in forensic psychiatry unit and mental health professionals. Let's understand and discuss about competency to stand trial. Why should we assess competency or fitness to stand trial? The competency to stand trial directly flows from principle of natural justice. The principles of natural justice are uncoded, unwritten, but accepted across the world. There are three in number. One is Audi Altem Partem, Numo Judex in Vasa Swaha and Reason Decision. Let's discuss each one of them. The first one is Audi Altem Partem. This is a very important principle of natural justice. Hear the other party. Let the other side be heard as well. Now, applying this principle for a person with mental illness. Imagine a person with mental illness is accused of committing a crime. Now, since he is not able to defend himself and he is not able to prove that he is innocent, that means you are violating the principle of natural justice. So, before a case is proceeded against the person with mental illness, we need to assess for his fitness to stand trial. Give a fair opportunity to defend himself. So, you need to treat him, you need to provide treatment and the case has to be heard. So, that is the reason Audi Altem Partem becomes one of the important point here in principle of natural justice, hence competency to stand trial. Coming to the second, Numo Judex in Kwasa Soha, that means rules against bias. Here, no one is judged in his own case. That means you should not judge your own case when you are accused. This is a very important point. However, that does not apply in our presentation here. The third one is reasoned decision. That means provide reason for the decision when the judicial pronouncement occurs. So, with these three important principles of natural justice which are unwritten, uncoded but accepted across the world. Now let's understand the competency to stand trial. To understand the competency of trial, we need to have a case vignette. Let's discuss an imaginary case vignette. Let's assume a crime has occurred in your locality. Yours is a posh locality and a VIP has been murdered. This occurred in the middle of the night and the police has been intimated. The police comes to the crime scene. They find a VIP has been murdered. Immediately they start receiving political calls, various senior bureaucrats calling them to immediately arrest the accused or the person who has committed the crime. The police starts a cooming operation in the locality. Exactly around one kilometer away from the house, they find a person wandering at large. He is untidy, shabbily dressed, 
not taken bath for long duration. When the pole is questioned him, he does not answer to them. He is muttering to self. The police become angry and they arrest him. They charge with the murder of the VIP because the police is also under tremendous pressure because of media and various reason. And the next day, in the newspaper, the headline comes as Mr. X, a VIP has been murdered and the police in a swift action has arrested a person who is wandering suspiciously in the locality. Now, the question is whether this person with mental illness did he commit the crime? Or else, by chance he is found in the locality. Now the police have arrested him and they have charged him with the murder. Now the question is, what are the safeguards this person with mental illness has under the constitution of India? Now in such a scenario, when a person with mental illness is in conflict with law, how he has to deal? Imagine the situation. Imagine what will happen to the person with mental illness. The safeguards under our constitution, there are three important. One is under Indian Penal Code Section 84, that is Insanity Defense. The second one is Criminal Procedure Code 1973, Chapter 25, from Section 328 to Section 338, that is a person with mental illness in conflict with law, what the magistrate has to do and the police has to do. And the finally, free legal aid under Legal Service Authority Act of 1987 or under Mental Health Care Act of 2017 where they clearly says that a person with mental illness need to be provided with free legal aid. Let's discuss about Indian Penal Code Section 84 which is well known as Insanity Defense. Section 84 IPC clearly says that nothing is an offense which is done by a person who at the time of doing it by reason of unsoundness of mind is incapable of knowing the nature of the act or that he is doing what is either wrong or contrary to the law. In simple words, a person who is suffering from mental illness and is so severely ill, he has lost his reasoning power and commits a crime. In such a scenario, that person will not be held responsible. Further, if a person with mental illness in conflict with law is arrested and brought in front of the magistrate, in such a scenario, Criminal Procedure Code 1973, Section 328 to 333 have been very clearly documented and coded. That comes under Chapter 25, which clearly says provision has to accused persons of unsoundness of mind. Let's discuss each one of them. Section 328 and 329 clearly talks about procedure in case of accused being a lunatic or of unsoundness mind tried before the court. When such person is brought in front of the magistrate and the magistrate finds that this person is unable to defend himself or else he has mental illness. In such a scenario, the magistrate will refer him to the nearest district surgeon for examination of mental illness and also to examine whether he is fit to stand trial. You may also refer him to the nearest public mental health establishment to examine by a psychiatrist for the same reason. During the procedure of examination, the trial will be suspended. It will be suspended as per Section 330. Section 330 clearly says that the magistrate has the authority to release that person of unsoundness of mind to the relative or to the family member or to the friend if the person is undergoing the fitness to stand trial or competency to stand trial examination or assessment. But the person who is going to take him under his custody, that is his friends, family or relatives need to give in undertaking telling that they will provide care, they will provide treatment and they will make sure that he is not going to harm anybody else or he will harm himself. So till the person is cured, he will be under that person's custody. Once the person becomes all right, Section 331 clearly says that the resumption of inquiry of trial. That means once the person becomes all right, the trial continues. Section 332 clearly says procedure on accused appearing before magistrate or court as found to be fit to stand trial. 
and section 333 when accused appears to have been of sound mind. So these are the various criminal procedure codes have been clearly documented in our constitution of India to, to protect a person with mental illness in conflict with law. Now let's understand when does this competency or fitness to stand trial arises. The competency to stand trial arises when a person with mental illness or a mental retardation or a neurological illness such as dementia, stroke or maybe encephalitis or any serious disorder are in conflict with law. This can appear before the commission of crime. That means the person has mental illness before the commission of crime and now he has committed the crime. Now he is in conflict with law or else during the commission of the crime. That is the second point. The third one is during the any stage of the trial. That means he has committed the crime and he was mentally sound. But during the process of the trial, he becomes unfit. That means he may develop stroke, he may develop dementia, he may develop mental illness or various other brain disorders. In such a scenario, fitness to stand trial has to happen. That means competency to stand trial has to be done. Let's discuss how it happens. If a person is unfit to stand trial, there are three possible reasons. One is mental illness, neurological illness and mental retardation. That is intellectual disability. Suppose the other reason is there is a malingering. This person is not answering, behaving as if he is mentally ill. Again, you have to assess and you have to clearly say whether this person is malingering or else has mental illness, mental retardation or neurological illness. If he is malingering, the resumption of trial immediately occurs. But please remember, unfitness to stand trial or competency to stand trial, if you are going to say he is unfit, there is, should be a logical explanation for the reason. That means whether he is mentally ill or whether he has mental retardation or neurological illness. That means every unfitness to stand trial need to be accompanied with a medical certificate that this person is suffering from mental illness or mental retardation or neurological illness which can be cured or not be cured has to be accompanied. And then you have to give a approximate time when the person will be all right and that certificate needs to be submitted to the court of law. Let's discuss. That means if a person has unfit to stand trial, that means he has mental illness or else neurological illness or else mental retardation or else the combination of each. Just because he has mental illness doesn't mean that he has unfit to stand trial. To be unfit to stand trial along with mental illness, he should also have loss of reasoning power. Similarly, if a person has neurological illness, that doesn't mean he is automatically is unfit to stand trial. Along with neurological illness, he should also have loss of reasoning power. That means mental capacity is impaired. And finally, with regard to mental retardation, because a person has mental retardation doesn't mean that he is unfit to stand trial. Along with mental retardation, his mental capacity should be impaired. Then only we will be considered as unfit to stand trial. Once he is considered as unfit to stand trial, immediately the treatment has to be started. Rehabilitation process should be initiated. Once he improves, there should be legal workshops, there should be some role plays and seminars so that the person with mental illness gets aware about the legal procedure of our situation or else of our judiciary. Once the treatment is done, there are two possible scenarios. Either he will become fit to stand trial or else he continues to be unfit to stand trial. If he is fit to stand trial, the trial will resume. If he is unfit to stand trial, the trial will be postponed. Again, he is unfit to stand trial and same procedure continues. This is how the competency to stand trial in India proceeds. Let's understand the process. The fitness to stand trial or competency to stand trial has to be revoked. That means has to be produced or it has to be told to the court either during the initiation of the trial or during the process of the trial. When such a scenario occurs, the magistrate has to be told that he is suffering from mental illness or neurological illness or mental retardation. 
In such a scenario, the magistrate will take the case and he will do the examination of the person and he will refer to the psychiatrist or else the district surgeon. If he is referred to the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist will do the competency assessment. And finally, once the assessment is over, submission of the report will occur to the court. This is how the process takes place. Let's discuss what is the role of psychiatrist in competency assessment. First and the foremost, he has to assess the fitness to stand trial. Not only that, just he has to assess the fitness, but he is going to say that he is unfit. That means he has to know the reason why he is unfit. That means reason for the decision. Suppose he has mental illness, what kind of mental illness he has, whether it is curable, whether it is treatable. So that needs to be commented upon. If he has low intellectual quotient, that means low IQ, that needs to be assessed and that has to be communicated to the court. If he has neurological illness, such as dementia, whether it is treatable or not treatable, need to be commented upon. Further, the treatment should be started. And finally, certification and recommendation has to be done to the court. Let's understand the whole process now again. There is a competency to stand trial assessment is done. Whether if there is competency is present, immediately the resumption of trial occurs. Suppose the competency to stand trial is absent. In such a scenario, the evaluation starts and the psychiatrist comes to know he is malingering. The same thing will be reported to the court. Resumption of trial immediately occurs. Suppose the person has mental illness or else mental retardation or else neurological illness such as stroke or else dementia. In such a scenario, the corrective measures will be taken that is treatment will be initiated and after the treatment, the psychiatrist will give a certificate that he is fit to stand trial and the resumption of trial occurs. This is the whole process of competency to stand trial. Now let's understand how the competency to stand trial assessment occurs. First and the foremost, when the referral is given, the psychiatrist need to ascertain the reason for competency to stand trial. Initiate detailed forensic psychiatry assessment. And it involves looking for the cause for unfitness if he is going to say this person is unfit to stand trial. He needs to do investigation if it is dementia or other neurological condition. Treatment of the underlying condition needs to be sorted out. Corrective measures to be taken. And finally, the certification occurs. Please remember, the competency to stand trial assessment can occur either on OPD basis or else inpatient basis. If it is the first time he is referred to the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist may ask for inpatient assessment, evaluation, investigation, observation, and then the certification. If the person is a world case, of a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist have all the medical records. He knows about the case thoroughly. In such a scenario, on, op on outpatient basis, the psychiatrist can give the certificate. It is completely the professional discretion of the psychiatrist to give this competency to stand trial assessment certification. For detailed forensic psychiatry evaluation, I have done a separate video. Please watch that video before you proceed. The main reason being is Every competency to stand trial assessment should occur only after forensic psychiatry assessment. Hence, you need to watch that video first. Once you are done the forensic psychiatry assessment, then only you have to do competency to stand trial assessment. Let's understand how to assess competency to stand trial. Competency to stand trial has five important components. They are cognitive function, understanding the charges, proceeding of the court or the trial, assisting the lawyer and behavior of the court. These are the five important components. Let's discuss each one of them. First and the foremost is cognitive function of the accused. What is his orientation for time, place and person? And the next, he is able to count from 1 to 20 and backwards 20 to 1. Whether he is able to give his address, whether he is able to name the objects, Basically, you want to know whether he has comprehension, whether he is able to have certain memory deficits or not. So that is the basic idea to do cognitive function. Here, you will elicit whether the person has dementia or else whether he has any other 
neurological illness which is which will come in his way of defending his case coming to the second that is understanding the charges whether a person with mental illness or neurological illness whether he is able to understand what are the charges framed against him what kind of pleas that is available for him what can happen to them if they plead guilty what processes are set in motion if he denies or if he doesn't plead guilty and if the charges are proved what are the consequences or what are the punishment whether he is able to understand and appreciate that is about understanding the charges moving to the third component understanding the court or trial proceedings here the person with mental illness or neurological illness or mental retardation should know how the trial occurs how the proceeding occurs is he aware about his legal rights whether he understand the trial process and the progress what is meant by witness what is meant by evidence does he know there may be witness against him or evidence against him is he aware the consequences of losing his case what is meant by appeal what is the role of judge what is the role of the attorney and various process is able to understand and appreciate that is understanding the court proceedings moving to the fourth that is helping the attorney this is a very important criteria what is the role of his lawyer in fighting the case whether he is able to understand and appreciate how will he help his lawyer to defend his case how does he answer such questions does he trust his lawyer that is very essential if the person with mental illness is suspicious towards his lawyer he may not be able to give important evidence to defend his case does he know the role of prosecution lawyer if he knows about all these things that means he is almost fit to stand trial and the last important is behavior in the court what must he do when the magistrate enters the court how will he address the magistrate what should what should he do before answering the question that is taking oath whether he is able to understand that what must he do if the opposite lawyer ask some questions which he does not know the answer what must he do if the opposite lawyer asks some provoking questions does he know the consequences of inappropriate behavior in the court of law that has to be asked if he knows all these things then only you will be arriving to the conclusion whether he is fit or unfit these five components are there these are the guidelines the questions can be asked they are semi structured in nature you need to assess on most daily basis if a person is found to be unfit if a person with delirium is there that means you need to assess almost daily twice so once the person is able to be fit for a period of consistently then only you will issue a certificate yes he is fit to stand trial however before you arrive at the conclusion you need to know certain things before arriving to the conclusion you have to do forensic detailed evaluation documents you should collect clinical interview you have to do serial ward observation serial mental status examination serial mini mental status examination serial cognitive functions and finally diagnosis based upon the above findings you will come to a conclusion whether he is fit or unfit again the whole process may take some time 2 weeks to 6 weeks depending upon the nature of the illness depending upon the available of information and also the psychiatrist clinical acumen or else professional discretion based upon you are going to give your opinion so possible interpretation and recommendation given by the forensic psychiatrist there are three possible interpretation one is the person is fit to stand trial you will receive that fit to stand trial certificate the trial will resume or else he is partially fit he requires support in the form of training workshop seminars education regarding the legal procedure that can be done that is the second the third is not fit because of the reason of unsoundness of mind or else neurological illness or mental retardation whether the reassessment to be done whether it is treatment resistance those information need to be given at the same time you need to give recommendations if a person with mental illness is found to be fit you need to recommend whether he needs to be continuing the medication or else he needs to stop the medication whether the rehabilitation process needs to be continued or not education information legal awareness 
legal aid should be given to or not role play has to be done so that he knows how to answer in the court of law sometimes some people will require workshop how the court is there court scenario who is the judge who is the attorney all those things needs to be explained to a person with mental illness in conflict with law now let's understand how to collect information because the biggest challenge in forensic psychiatry is a person with mental illness is produced in front of a forensic psychiatrist by a police there is no family member no relatives or friends that means the complete evaluation is directly from the patient or the client that means you are completely handicapped you have to start off from you have to start from zero that means you will start with the premise that this person is normal this person is fit to stand trial and then you do the assessment here the forensic psychiatrist need to know the context of the assessment when was the assessment requested Info information regarding the charges try to get the fir try to get old treatment documents call the family members do the assessment do the interview of the family members do the colleagues interview and also look for the accompanying letters look for the post mortem report past treatment details past history of crime and if he is a re offender look for all the charges talk to the defense lawyer talk to the prosecution lawyer so you need to collect all information possible from all 360 degree and you have to be very careful when you interview the accused observe the body language of the person look for the physiological arousal whether he is telling lie whether he is malingering and also behavior during the interview whether he is evasive whether he is over talkative whether he is trying to manipulate you so those needs to be documented as and when you do the interview further when you are doing the interview be patient you may require multiple sessions avoid prejudice don't have a certain notion imagine if you are assessing a person who has abused his own daughter or else a child you will have a prejudice if imagine a person with mental illness has been framed charges of killing his own mother you will have certain emotions within you don't let those emotions come in your way of assessment have your appropriate body language do not challenge the accused in the initial part of your assessment do it at the end because once you challenge him he will not be cooperative ask as much as open ended questions sometimes it's very difficult to empathize with person with mental illness in conflict with law it is justifiable but however please be as objective as possible during your assessment and very important another weapon is ward observation please do serial ward observation this is how the ward observation is done collect the information from all possible sources inside the ward it may be staff nurse it may be escorts ward attenders other ward inmates do serial mental status examination check the cctv personal hygiene all possible information need to be collected for ward observation it is not one observation it is a serial observation which will give you a complete comprehensive ward observation report what are the things you should look for what is the assistance required for day to day functioning what about his personal hygiene grooming dressing bathing participating in ward activities check for his social functioning how does he interact with the staff inmates escorts and other person who is coming into the ward check for his biological functioning how is his sleep how is his food intake how is his bowel bladder habit those are the information you need to collect on daily basis check for any abnormal behavior check for any excessive behavior like talking to self smiling to self whether they are consistently present or else infrequently present or only present when the treating team is observing him look for deficit behavior that means withdrawn behavior look for disorganized behavior check for his behavior when unnoticed how does he behave how does he behave look for the compliance to medication look for his habits such as smoking bds or else any other drug drug intake inside the ward and look for any contradictory behavior noted suppose he says he is feeling very suicidal or he is feeling very depressed on the contrary in the ward he is very happy talking to all inmates check for those contradictory behavior 
To conclude, my dear friends, witness to stand trial or competency to trans stand trial is requested by the court during any stage of the trial. It may be during the insertion of the trial or else during the process of the trial. Any time competency to stand trial can be asked. The interpretation of competency to stand trial will follow only after forensic psychiatry assessment. Sometimes you need to admit the patient and do a thorough investigations and also serial mental status examination, serial cognitive function, serial ward behavior observation and various other investigation has to be done. Some clients needs assistance to understand the court proceedings if they have partially fit. So my dear friends, please remember competency to stand trial assessment is not a standalone assessment. It needs to be accompanied by complete thorough forensic psychiatry evaluation. Invariably competency to stand trial evaluation will be followed by insanity defense evaluation and certification. Hence, my dear colleagues, please be careful when you do competency to stand trial assessment. Do assessment comprehensively. If possible, do it inpatient. Thank you very much for giving your valuable time and support. Stay safe.